All right, hey everyone, it's Tim Ria here live at the HPA Tech Retreat from Australia. We have Mike Seymour with Effects Guide. Uh, we have Colton, um, Colton Melhoff from Stratasys, and we have Vlad Gallant and Jigs from LA from the scan truck. Hey everybody, how are you doing? Oh, it's great. Yeah, no, it's great. And I've got to say, like, the thing that I like about uh, scanning and 3D printing is, of course, we're moving from the, the real world into the digital world and from the digital world back into the physical world. And I think that's increasingly what's uh, important to both creatives and to the experiential stuff that uh, people are just wanting to uh, get into. And so we were talking a lot about um, going from pixels to atoms to atoms to pixels and back. And so let's roll a video and show everybody behind the scenes. Yeah, I was really uh, interested. I know that uh, we're going to get to some of the scanning stuff uh, in a second, but just on the 3D printing end, I think, um, like, obviously, these are relatively small, but they're actually done on an industrial scale. I was wondering if you can just give us, like, some parameters now on, like, what the sort of cutting edge scope of what you can do with 3D printing, because for a lot of people, they have a view, I think, that's like a few years old of what you can actually pull off. For a start, like, it's full color printing, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, great question. So at Stratasys, we have many different polymer technologies, but the one that was used to print those bottle caps is kind of like printing on paper, right? With cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. But instead of just printing one layer on paper, it prints thousands of layers using a photopolymer. It's basically acrylic. So it comes in as a liquid resin and we'll jet that onto the tray and using all those materials at the same time and then cure it from liquid to a solid. So we can make any rainbow of colors by mixing together cyan, magenta, yellow, white, black, and clear on the parts in real time while it's printing. So that's that's how those are made. It really uh, blends the, the two worlds together where with scanning, you can take a real thing and bring it into the screen. And now 3D printing, you can make something digitally and then bring it out of the screen. Yeah, I mean, this is incredibly important for uh, art departments and production designers uh, because of, you know, what they can realize. But I think the other thing that people maybe think of, certainly I know, you know, some of my friends, not only do they think that it's going to be one color and you have to paint it manually later, but they think of it as being kind of blobby. But you actually have high fidelity when it comes to being able to produce like a surface. Do you want to discuss that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the color contrast is really nice on these. In X and Y, we have a 300 by 600 DPI, and then the layer heights are down to 14 microns. That's half the width of a human hair. It doesn't take a long time to print because we can print a two and a half inch swath at, at one time. That picture of pizza is great, Tim, if you can bring that back up. That's an example of, a, of another piece that was scanned. Um, you can see the top even looked kind of greasy. The, the seasoning and the plate was real. So bringing something that's printed and something real together really makes the, the, the best prop. Uh, this video actually shows uh, a printed pizza and then a real piece of pizza next to it. You can't tell which one is which without looking real close. Uh, so that one's fun as well. 
Uh, there's a uh, Leica is a, a studio that made movies like Missing Link, Kubo and the Two Strings, Coraline. And with Coraline, they had to have these discussions around how many freckles is Coraline going to have because the artist needs to paint on each freckle. But now with 3D printing in color, they don't need to worry about that because they can print in full color with color gradients and all the detail they want to have straight out of the printer. Yeah, and I think the other thing that's really important about that is the consistency you get because in uh, that uh, example, be it in stop frame animation or just with uh, props that we're using in a production environment, it's incredibly important that if you're producing multiple versions that they're consistent. You, know, you don't get that with a manual post-paint process. Yes, 100%. And there's a lot of processes that go into that. So when you're producing a, a large stop motion film, you're actually putting a lot of processes to make sure that one print is the same as the next print, same as the next print, or between two different printers. Uh, but it is possible. Uh, whereas on films like Gods of Mars, where you're just trying to bring something from the screen into the foreground, uh, you, you can actually apply some paint to roughen up some areas, do some modifications that way. Uh, and 3D printing is, is a great tool for that application as well. So if I can jump now to the scan truck guys. So in the video we saw, we saw two different types of scanners. The main one I think was the, uh, is it 200 uh, DSLR for the uh, sort of body height or body person sort of shape? Is that the, is that the configuration? Sure, yeah, we built that uh, first rig in my garage, Vlad and I, labor of love, um, 210 DSLR cameras, um, and uh, built it into a truck, which is hence the name, the scan truck, uh, which has been fun. I think it's opened up a lot of, uh, you know, opportunities for us that wouldn't have existed otherwise. I, I don't even think they would have implemented the technology if we weren't able to come to them uh, with the, you know, the short amount of time they have on set or at a celebrity's house or whatnot. Um, so that's been fun. Uh, we actually just, finished building our second truck. Um, it's actually a trailer. Um, and we went even bigger with that one. That one's got double expandables. Um, we started a company um, called SPL that's out in uh, uh, Atlanta. So that's going to be an Atlanta based uh, mobile scanning uh, truck. Um, and uh, the second thing that we were using, uh, Vlad, if you want to talk about that a bit, it's pretty, pretty cool. That was the handheld one? Yeah, that's right. So the second scanner was the Creoform MetroScan, and it's a blue light laser. So what's really cool about that, uh, besides all of the precision stuff, that laser is able to scan chrome and glass. So something like this, which was previously impossible to capture in detail, is now possible with that scanner. So I think the first time that we scanned uh, an actual light bulb with it, that's, that was pretty mind blowing to us because we were always facing challenges like, you know, with photogrammetry, you get insane quality of the texture, but what about the actual geometry? So if you have something clear, it is really difficult to get this with photogrammetry, unless if you spray it or, you know, coat it with some kind of powder. And a lot of times it's not an option. So when we're working on set and they're bringing us shiny swords or we're working at a museum and they're bringing us artifacts, coding it is not an option. So we needed a solution that is actually able to, you know, scan something that's really difficult and deliver really high fidelity quality of the surface. While we're on that, I just wanted to ask you a specific question on faces, because exactly what you're talking about has been the problem with scanning faces. Um, teeth, in, for example, don't tend to get scanned because of the specular highlights. <laughs> and of course, as you move, the specular highlights move, so it just confuses the scanners. Could you use that scanner on, say, somebody's mouth or teeth or something like that? Or is it safe to use on someone like that? It's funny. Um, it's funny that you mentioned it because we were working on a project right now where they um, wanted us to scan teeth in specifically for a video game. So um, the answer to that is there is a better way to do it. And the better way to do it is use cross polarized lighting. Because when you're scanning with a hand scanner, it's really tough to get the subject to stand still because it does take a little time. So this is precisely why with photogrammetry, we have to take all of those photos at the same moment because there is no there's no shaking, there's no camera movement. So all those 
images are taken at the same time. So what we're doing with the new SPL trailer is we're using cross-polarized light, and that effectively cuts down on all of the specular highlights, and we're only capturing the, the true color information of the object. So if we're... So you're doing a, uh, a diffuse albedo pass, and then you're, what, presumably subtracting that from the full color to get the specular pass? Yeah, so essentially we're, we have two sets of cameras. One is parallel polarized and the other one is cross polarized. So we're able to get the specular information in, in a different data set. But that true yep. cross polarized texture is what's, what's giving us the, the information that we need to create an accurate reconstruction of the geometry. Yeah, and a bit like the problem you had with the glass, with uh, human skin, of course, you don't want that diffuse beneath the surface, because the second you diffuse to get subsurface, of course, you get loss of resolution. It's that specular that's giving you that fine, poor detail that we so desperately want. Hey, um, can I ask you a question? The the scanning for 3D printing, um, I want an instant one moment in time because I want to, you know, produce obviously a rigid object. What happens? Can you do any kind of temporal stuff or how are you like dealing with uh, sort of subsequent scans? Do you do any work in terms of uh, connecting up temporally or in terms of uh, providing a consistent sort of UV? Or... Uh, so you're saying scanning uh, people for 3D print or objects? In the truck, yeah. No, I'm saying in the truck, yeah. like obviously if I'm scanning someone to make a, uh, a 3D print, it's not an issue. But sometimes I want things like people where I've got multiple expressions, multiple scans. I'm just wondering whether, uh, like how do you deal with that, like in terms of mapping between, or is it just done on a, a, like a per frame basis? Yeah, we scan uh, like pretty much like each scan is like a still image. And, you know, we got... 210 still images, and we reconstruct a, a static 3D model. So that 3D model initially is up to 100 million polygons with you know super high resolution texture, which we bring down to 16K, and then we also bring down the poly count to something that's manageable. So for 3D print, you know, we'd probably bring that down to under a million polygons and then apply that same you know, texture map, which is probably going to be somewhere around four to eight K at that point. And, um, and then, yeah, it's ready to go to print. Colton, what's the sort of, uh, data sort of depth that you guys want? Like how, how broad do you want, or how big, I guess, do you want that fire hose of data to be? Is it, um, is it like upsampled in the process? We we're just talking about the incredibly fine resolution of 3d printing these days. Yeah, great question. So with a 3D printing about 600 by 300 DPI, um, the file size of Vlad mentioned is is great. You can do a, a peach or something about the size of a fruit in that complexity uh, with about 200,000 triangles. And when you go above that, you're not going to see a difference in the printed output uh, in a, um, about 4,000 by 4,000 image uh, texture map is also great for that size of an object. But it's going to depend on the size and also how detailed the texture or the, let's say, physical texture is on that part. So when you're getting the 3D print, like I know you've done like, you know, cups that have liquid in them, right? Uh, how does it know to like treat it as semi-transparent? I mean, is there a manual process to indicate this transparency? Like, or is it, is it just deriving that from the image? I mean, I'm just sort of curious because I understand what it looks like as a as a piece of geo, but how does it sort of map that in terms of that speculum, that, that sense that the liquids, which are obviously still, are actually yeah. liquids in your uh, 3D prints? Yeah, so oftentimes semi-transparent models will go through a program like Keyshot, or you can just use a slider in our print prep software and say this is gonna have this amount of transparency. Uh, but through programs like Keyshot, you can apply semi uh, transparency to labels. But you can also apply transparency to whole bodies. So, for example, in, in a liquid, you would in Keyshot because it's a, a rendering engine that's going to render the depth of liquids. You can then render the uh, the, the the appearance of it, and then we'll transfer that into the slicing software, and it's going to know oh based on that appearance, this is how much of the resin I need to put into that area and how much clear to put that into that area to uh, uh, replicate what you see on screen. Well, it's been great talking to you guys. And Tim, I just like to point out, I don't actually have my bottle cap here. I mean, um, we, um, you know, there's nothing that's arrived, mate. <laughs>
We, uh, we're also going to print you some clothing, and I was curious just to wrap up with Colton. You can also do um, fabrics. So we're, what size are you, Mike? <laughs> uh i guess i'm an xl but but hang on a second you're saying that you're printing fabric or you're printing something that looks like it's fabric we're printing really on fabric so this is really what's coming oh, next wow. in 3d printing is uh, uh, inserting a piece of fabric into the 3d printer and then printing with full color on that piece of fabric and it could be a replacement for screen printing where you don't need to store the screens anymore but then you're adding layers onto this so you are adding uh, physical size to what you're printing on there uh, as far as t physical texture. And then you're also adding color onto it. So you can have color gradients that are not possible to do with just screen printing. Uh, it's coming into mm -hmm. the, the Hollywood fashion film industry. So if I was printing on fabric, would that add rigidity or is it still going to have uh, a certain amount of flexibility in the fabric? Or does that, as I build up the layers, go away? Great question. So when we're printing on fabric, we'll print patterns that are disconnected. So let's say two millimeter size pieces, but there's many of them that come together in this pattern. And as the fabric moves, the fabric is moving in the areas between these 3D printed geometries on the fabric. So the fabric is still nice and flexible. And as it moves, the shape and the appearance of this may actually change because of how you designed that part you printed on fabric. Brilliant. That's just outstanding. I can't wait to see that. So, um, well, thanks everybody for, for joining us. I'm really excited about how fast this came together and it just shows that if everybody puts uh, the pedal to the metal and has resources, we could create something that is magic out of thin air. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having us.